All right, hi everybody, it's Andrea here. This week we are talking about the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And right now I'm going to read you a book about the Mackinac Bridge. And this is the bridge that when we leave the Lower Peninsula to go to the Upper Peninsula, you cross across this bridge. So this book is called Mackinac Bridge, the story of the five mile poem by Gloria Whelan, illustrated by Gisbert von Frankenhusen. If only his father, Captain Hansen, hadn't been so sad, Mark Hansen's 13th summer would have been the happiest summer of his life. Mark's dad was letting him help to line up the cars as they drove onto the Aurora. His dad was captain of a ferry boat that carried travelers across the Straits of Mackinac. This would be that, Aurora's last year on the Straits. Mark had been riding the Aurora as long as he could remember. On hot summer days, Mark had sold lemonade to the long line of drivers waiting to ride the ferry. In November, deer hunters by the hundreds of thousands traveled to the Upper Peninsula. Mark sold hot chocolate to hunters who sometimes had to wait overnight to get onto one of the ferries. The Aurora was the smallest in a fleet of ferries carrying cars and passengers between Mackinac City and St. Ignace. The ferry boats were like a road on the water connecting Michigan's upper and lower peninsulas. From the deck of the Aurora, Mark could see what made him so happy and what made his father, Captain Hansen, so sad. He could see the bridge. When it was finished in the fall, the bridge would be the longest bridge in the world. It would stretch an amazing five miles across the Straits of Mackinac. It took an hour to cross the Straits in the Aurora. That didn't count the hours of waiting in line. It would take a car just 15 minutes to cross the bridge. The bridge would mean the end of the ferries, the end of the Aurora. How could Mark tell his father how much he loved the bridge, especially after what his older brother Luke had done? Mark was proud of the Aurora, as his dad was. He liked the way the gangplank clanged down when, with a growl. He liked the way the big mouth of the ferry swallowed up the cars. He liked the Aurora, but he loved the idea of a bridge something that could go right through the air and bring things together. Mark had heard his father say, any bridge across the straits is sure to collapse. It would never hold up to 70 mile an hour winds and pounding from ice floats as tall as 30 feet, a 30 foot building. A lot of people shook their heads and said it couldn't be done. Three years before in 1954, when they had first begun to build the bridge, it looked like all of the barges and derricks in the whole world were right out there in the lake. Luke said, there's a lot you can't even see. Divers are working hundreds of feet under the water, putting in piers to anchor the bridge. Two of the piers are like empty buildings. Two are like giant steel cans. They're going to fill the piers with concrete. Those big barges out there are mixing the concrete, nearly a million tons of the stuff. When the bridge is done, two thirds of it will be underwater. Then Luke said something strange. It's next year I'm waiting for. What do you mean, Mark asked. Wait and see, Luke said. All summer, the barges made concrete. All summer, the concrete disappeared under the straits. Mark tried to imagine the divers down there with all their equipment. It must be like an underwater city, he thought. He wished he was there. When winter came, the gulls flew south. Bridge workers left, ferries stopped their runs. Four feet of ice sealed off the straits. The winds blew and the snow came down and Mark thought about the underwater city beneath the ice. The summer of 1955, the steel workers arrived. Luke said, they're going to build two towers, towers that will stretch 552 feet into the air. You'll be able to see them for miles around. I'm going to help them do it. 
I've got a job as a bridge man. The bridge is going to put me and the Aurora out of business, Captain Hansen said. How could you give them a hand? Luke stopped talk. He stopped talking to Luke. Meal times were pretty quiet. Finally, Mrs. Hansen said, I'm not sitting through another silent dinner. I understand why your dad resents the bridge, but the bridge is going up and Luke m might just as well be a part of it. Captain Hansen said, pass the bread, Luke. The silence was broken. Mark breathed a sigh of relief. He smiled, th thinking his mom had been like a bridge herself, bringing his dad and Luke together. Luke had a special pair of gloves and a helmet to wear at work. He left each morning before Mark was awake. Mark watched the tower going up on the north side of the bridge. Luke was up on that tower, king of everything he saw. When the first tower was in place, an American flag was hoisted to the top. By October, flags were flying on both towers. In January, winter winds lashed the towers, pounding and shaking them. The towers stood firm with their ice-coated ribs. Mark thought they looked like two frozen skeletons. Mark and Luke built their own bridge on the kitchen table. It will be a suspension bridge, Luke said. The roadway the cars drive over will be held up by a cradle of cables. Mark made two towers from milk cartons. There's nothing in the milk in the middle, he said. How are they going to get the cables from the one tower to the other? Luke said, they'll build a catwalk, a temporary path to walk on while they spin the wires. Luke wrapped strands of wire around two of their mother's spools of thread. He told Mark to string wire from one end of the bridge to the towers and then to the other end of the bridge. More wires hung down to hold up a cardboard roadway. They had made a bridge. Mark read everything he could find about bridges. He read about David Steinman, the engineer who designed the Mackinac Bridge and was supervising its building. Mr. Steinman designed and built bridges all over the world. He wrote poetry too. He said the Mackinac Bridge would be a poem stretched across the straits. Next summer, Mark would be working full time on the ferry. He decided he would save his money and go to engineering school. While the snow crept down from the roof of their house and up from the ground, closing off the windows, Mark imagined himself in the steamy jungles of Brazil, building bridges across the Amazon River. In the spring of 1956, the bridgemen made a catwalk of two wires on each side of the bridge. They draped the wires over the two towers in a graceful curve. Chain link fencing was placed between the wires. The catwalk would allow the workers to spin the cables that would hold up the bridge. Luke came home. I walked it, he shouted. I walked right across the bridge on the catwalk. Mark saw his mom shiver as she looked out at the narrow pathway 500 feet in the air. I guess it's time for me to look for a new job, Cap Captain Hansen said. A necklace of lights was strung across the catwalk for the bridge men who were working around the clock. Mark dreamed he was alone up on the catwalk, so close to the moon and the stars he could touch them. All summer long, wheels like giant spiders crept back and forth across the bridge stringing wires. Mark could hear the cowbells on the wheels warning the men on the catwalk to get out of the way. There were over 12,000 strands of wire on each cable. The cables had to be strong for they would hold up the floor of the bridge. Captain Hansen said, I heard they're going to chop the top off one of the ferries and use it as a barge. I'd sink the Aurora before I'd let them do that to her. The winter, that winter, an officer came for the ferry. When the bridge was completed, the Aurora would be sent downstate to the Detroit River. At least it will still be carrying cars, the captain said. What about you, Dad? Mark asked. What will you do? I got a pretty good offer from a company whose ferries go from Mackinac City to Mackinac Island. That's great, Dad, Mark said, but he couldn't help thinking of how small those Mackinac Island ferries were.
you could put a couple of them inside the Aurora. The April of 1957 brought one of the Strait's worst storms. 70 mile an hour gusts bent the trees and stacked ice as high as skyscrapers. When the Gauls returned later in the spring, the bridge still stood. The sum that summer, the shores were crowded with cheering people. They had come to watch the roadway lifted onto its steel support and attached to the fringe of the wire that hung down from the cables. At last, the lower and upper peninsulas were joined. Mark's heart was going so fast he could hardly breathe. There was still a lot to do to meet the November 1st deadline. The roadway had to be paved and the bridge painted. Now when Luke went to work, their mom packed dinner for him as well as lunch. Sometimes he didn't get home until midnight. Sometimes he worked all night. Captain Hansen was working long hours as well. He was polishing all the bright work on the Aurora and giving her deck a new coat of paint. I want to be proud of the boat I send downstate, he said. He gave the ferry a loving pat. Mark jumped out of bed. It was the first of November. Today, the bridge would be open to traffic. Michigan's governor was going to lead the parade. Schools had been given the day off. Hundreds of cars would be crossing the bridge. Just as Mark and Luke were leaving, the captain said, I hope you're not planning to cross the bridge without your mother and me. That night, there was a celebration with fireworks. Mark and Luke and their mom and dad watched from the deck of the Aurora. The sparks from the fireworks tangled with the lights from the bridge. When the fireworks were over, Captain Hansen brought the ferry boat home from its last trip across on the straits. Later, after everyone was asleep, Mark crept out of the house. It was warm for November. He walked the mile from their house to the straits, the stri string of lights glittering on the deserted bridge. Mark was sure that somewhere there was a river wider than the straits, and he would build the bridge across it. And that is the end. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Bye.